And we're on the campaign trail uh, trying to uh, catch up with the candidates uh, running for office here in Nebraska. And we're pleased to be joined now by Sid Dinsdale, who is uh, one of those seeking the Republican nomination for the U.S. Senate to take the place of, of Mike Johans. Well, uh, Sid, uh, we're down to the kind of the final days now where people really start paying attention. So uh, tell us how the campaign's been going. Well, I think it's been going very well. Uh, you know, we've been up in media for three or four weeks now, and we'll be up through May 13th, Election Day. And we've got the uh, material to do it and the resources to do it, so we'll see what happens. Well, let's uh, talk about uh, Sid Dinsdale. They may know the Dinsdale name, but uh, you've been one that uh, maybe hasn't been out in front, so a lot of people know know your face anyway, but they may know your name. So tell us a little bit about uh, Sid Dinsdale. Sure. Well, I grew up in Palmer, 30 miles north of Grand Down, uh, doing farm stuff like a lot of kids across Nebraska. And uh, my brother and I are still in the cattle business, for example, and, and uh, farm and so forth, have companies that do. But I spent 37 years in the community banking business running Pinnacle Bank, uh, which uh, we have locations in eight states in the Midwest, and I've been around a long time, and that's what I've done. All right, let's get to the issues. Obviously, we talk Nebraska, we talk agriculture. Uh, in the national scene, the Farm Bill, the Farm Bill, the Farm Bill. Well, the Farm Bill is done now, and so there's other focuses, things like trade promotion authority, things like uh, tax structure and keeping the next generation. Let's talk about uh, some of those ag issues that uh, you'll be facing if you're the next U.S. Senator. Well, I, I think this has been the golden age of agriculture, don't you, Ken? Uh, and particularly now with cattle making money like they are, uh, finally the cattle feeders are making some money. Uh, Ethanol is doing well. We just need some rain right now, darn it. That's what we really need. But I, I think it's been really, uh, it has been really great to travel across the state and, and see places I hadn't seen and, and tell my friends in Lincoln and Omaha what our state's really about. You know, they, they don't hardly get out of cities to see what we got, but people around the world know what Nebraska agriculture is about. So I'd be excited to represent uh, agriculture in Washington, D.C. As I travel around, uh, Farmers would like to unhook from the social aspect of the farm bill. As you know, 80% of it is nutrition <clears throat> Excuse me. with food stamps. And most farmers uh, want catastrophic coverage, uh, but uh, not a whole big, huge farm bill. They just want to market their crops and farm and try to make some money. Of course, we're at the mercy of the world markets, and sometimes that requires uh, federal intervention. But mostly they just want protection from catastrophic events like that terrible blizzard we had last fall. Another big issue, uh, renewable fuel standard and the future of uh, renewables and uh, the importance it plays in the brass economy, especially with, with ethanol production. Right. Full disclosure, uh, I'm an investor, as my brother is, in, in ethanol, but I think ethanol is a heck of a product, and it's an oxygen with so many people that criticize it don't realize. If you've been to Denver lately, there's no brown cloud, for example, because of ethanol mostly. And it's been just great for our state, uh, a lot of places with an ethanol plant and good jobs and a good market for farmers' crops. But uh, one of the things that's going on that I'm really concerned about right now is moving grain because, you know, the, the oil uh, uh, in the Bakken has occupied so much of the train capacity when I travel around. That's uh, really impacting our uh, transport of corn around uh, to different markets. Well, those are a number of different issues. Uh, transportation is one that uh, I'm sure would be one that you'll have to focus an awful lot on. Uh, as we look at some of the advertisements you're running, and, and one I think is, is probably catching on with people, we talk about regulations and over-regulations by the federal government, not only with the EPA and, and how it works with agriculture, but uh, uh, kind, of ever, kind of that overreach. Uh, talk about uh, how you see that uh, here in the federal government. Well, I was just asked earlier today, Ken, why do you think the, the economy is kind of soft and we aren't really hiring and stuff? And I really think uh, there's two main issues, the uh, overreach of the federal government with so many regulations and then the taxes that we pay. You know, I, I've been back to Washington, D.C. once in the last 25 years, and that was a couple months ago. And Washington, D.C. is doing very, very well. But you just feel like you're coming right out of your pocket, right out of your wallet. So I think we have a big growing government that keeps growing, and these agencies like EPA, uh, you're probably aware of the story in Holt County about OSHA trying to find a farm family. And there's all kinds of stories out there. And other things like uh, a distributor in the middle of the state that doesn't handle anything hazardous but has to have a safety director. And we almost get to where we accept those things. I don't want to accept those things. I think they really hurt 
businesses' abilities to get ahead. And just back to my community banking business that I'm in, these little banks, they can't hardly make a mortgage loan because the compliance standards are so tough. Uh, they end up making it unsecured if they make it at all, and that's more risk for them. And then the borrower doesn't get that deduction for that interest cost. So there's just regulation everywhere, and that's really what spurred me to run, Ken, because I'm just frustrated. I think if the government would get out of the way mostly, uh, we would just unleash our economy like we haven't seen for a long time. And it goes on and on. Energy independence, uh, for example. Of course, Obamacare is at the top of everybody's mind. There's just a lot of things that when you put them together are barriers or additional challenges to businesses uh, succeeding. People, people don't realize how hard it is to start a business, keep a business going, whether it's a farmer or a retailer or a distributor or whatever it is. Have you had the opportunity to, to kind of really work at that federal budget and look at things, you know, Social Security and other things, those those situations are uh, take up a huge portion of that, but are there things that you've seen that can cut or enhancements that can be made uh, to, to make it more efficient? Well, if you kind of break down the, the budget, around 48% of it is Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, about 18% of it's defense, and discretionary spending is a big number, 18%. So I say that we've got to work on entitlements. Above 50 years old, you keep those promises. But below 50, as I've talked to younger people across Nebraska, they realize it's not going to be there anyway if we don't make some changes. That's where the big money is. And that discretionary spending, too. And then even though it's not the huge money, I think there's a number of ways to cut fat and even eliminate some of these federal departments like the Department of Education. So I, I would really relish the opportunity to work on the budget and hopefully find other United States senators that would work with me for the good of America because we've got to get our balance sheet in shape. We, we are a, just a huge, wonderful, powerful, mismanaged country right now, in my opinion, kind of like a mismanaged business. Another issue is, is immigration, and you see what's going on in Congress now, both the House and the Senate. Uh, we're not really moving the ball forward. Would you be a leader in trying to get a meaningful immigration reform uh, started at least? You bet. I, you know, I'm all about more state and less federal, and this is a classic case. I went down to Nogales, Arizona, and went to the border, which I hadn't done before, and I saw our 18-foot fence. It cost $2 million per mile to build, but it's darn near impenetrable. I mean, 18-foot uh, is really tall, and it's got barricades holding it together and steel reinforced concrete and so forth. But the problem with the fence is after three or four miles outside of Nogales, it stops. And then you have what I describe as a little X fence, if you know what that is like, like they have the mountains where you can't put a post in the ground. And that goes for 300 yards. So my point is, we got to get that border sealed. And I would really be in favor of letting the states do it. I just think local is better. There's more accountability because they're the ones directly in, impacted by the, the people coming across the border to have a baby or eventually end up in Nebraska, wherever. But we need to seal that border. We seal the border, then let's figure out what we want to do with those that are here uh, illegally, send back the ones with criminal record, try to figure out an overall policy that makes sense. We've asked all the candidates an international question to, to look at what's going on in the Ukraine, Crimea, Putin, and so on. If you're one of a hundred come January, there may be a big decision needs to be made about uh, military action and so on. So uh, talk about uh, your look at the, at, the, at the big picture of international affairs and the role the U.S. Uh, plays in it. Yeah. You know, Ken, I've been around a while, and it just doesn't seem like there's many new lessons. They just keep coming around again. This just looks like uh, what we've seen before in history, where you have somebody who's expansion-minded, who's not a very good guy, meaning Putin and Russia, who wants to expand his empire no matter what it costs and brings up these fake situations to justify his actions. Unfortunately, militarily, I don't think we have very many good options. But back to energy independence, we've got to unhook Europe from Gazprom. That's that huge Russian utility that provides natural gas to Eastern Europe because that more or less neuters them from being able to do anything. Now, I see where we're having a small exercise in Poland to try to reinforce our NATO tie to those European countries. But we got to step up and do whatever we can do. But I, I will tell you something else as a banker, and I've been fortunate to travel around the world. When you're a resident of a country where you don't trust your government, like a Russia or a China, uh, the first thing you do if you succeed is you put your wealth somewhere else in a hard good. And there are Russian people of wealth that have put their money in Europe and the United States that we can really get their attention with economic sanctions, and I mean tough ones. So if we do that,
Putin will get the message, and I think we can have an effect, but it really makes me nervous because our president, to me, I'm afraid, has perpetuated this situation with how he's conducted himself. Um, you know, we all like to reference Reagan, peace through strength, and that's really a simple, very uh, eloquent phrase. We, we got to realize bad people around the world don't operate the way we do. There's only one thing they understand, that's power. And we've got to have a great military, and that's the one department that is absolutely necessary. And gosh, I've got a couple of really good friends who are retired Air Force colonels that advise me on these things. I'm on the STRATCOM consultation committee. Don't mess with the Defense Department. Sure, we've got to have some budget constraints. Just give them a number. They'll, they'll make it work, but, but we've got to be a strong country. Well, Sid, one of the things we've asked every candidate, uh, because there's a number of you running, what makes you unique? Why, uh, you know, everybody's kind of saying the same things, uh, so they're looking for something unique, and then uh, why you would want to be that next leader uh, in the U.S. Senate from sure. Nebraska, so, uh, so tell us. Sure. Well, I'm a conservative pro-life Republican, but I'm self-term limited to two terms, because I've had, I've had a great career as a community banker for 37 years. But I hope Nebraskans will look at me and what I've done in my life and my career as a community banker, still involved with agriculture, actually have around 800 people uh, working for us across the great state of Nebraska. My wife and I have also served extensively in the charity world and, and been very involved with Habitat for Humanity and Methodist Health System, for example. My point is I've done a lot of things in my life, uh, and I'm a Nebraskan. I'll always be a Nebraskan. But probably the biggest difference is that uh, the support for my United States Senate campaign is from Nebraskans. Over 80% of that support is from Nebraskan, and I'm putting some of my own resources into the race. Whereas the other challengers have chosen to use Washington uh, special interest groups, lobbyists, and PACs to fund uh, their campaigns extensively. And you know those PACs, I didn't know myself until a few weeks ago, they have three million members in some of those PACs, way more than we have the population of Nebraska is 1.9 million. So it's kind of coming down to me and, and my Nebraska support uh, against those from outside Nebraska that want to elect the next U.S. Senator in Nebraska. Thanks. You bet. Thanks again. Sid Dinsdale, who is a candidate for the uh, Republican nomination for the U.S. Senate from Nebraska. We're in Lincoln for Ag View. I'm Ken Rogers.